Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Widely considered one of the most gifted central bankers of the modern era, Raghuram Rajan is a highly prominent voice on monetary policy in the global macro economy, and it was my distinct privilege to bring his insights to the Alpha Exchange. Now the Catherine Dusak Miller, Distinguished Professor of Finance at Chicago Booth, Dr. Rajan was the head of the Reserve Bank of India from 2013 to 2016, stewarding the country's economy and its financial system through a precarious time, punctuated by a violent currency sell-off and a challenging bout of inflation. Our conversation covers monetary policy, episodes of financial crisis, the fallout from COVID-19, and that pesky conundrum, inflation. Dr. Rajan gives the Powell Fed high marks on its forceful response to the pandemic, crediting it with staving off a self-reinforcing asset price sell-off. At the same time, he worries that as the central bank becomes more interventionist, it risks being captured by markets and will find itself unable to extricate from extraordinary levels of accommodation. Lastly, we discussed Dr. Rajan's most recent book, The Third Pillar, an important contribution to how policymakers should think about the interaction between the state, markets, and local communities. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Dr. Raghuram Rajan. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Raghuram Rajan. He is the Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at Chicago Booth. He's also the 23rd Governor of the Reserve Bank of India from 2013 to 2016 and was the Chief Economist of the IMF, a man that really needs very little introduction. Dr. Rajan, I'm really pleased and thankful that you are spending some time with us today on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, there's so much going on in the world of markets. We've obviously had a long summer from a social cohesion standpoint. There's so much uncertainty on that front as well, especially as we confront an election and we're in the midst of a pandemic that has just had dramatic impacts on the economy, on the labor markets, on Fed policy. So we'll have no shortage of things to dive into. You wrote a really important book last year, and it turns out it's incredibly prescient in a lot of ways, The Third Pillar. You talked a lot about some of the challenges that capitalism faces, and I'm wondering if you can just spend a little bit of time walking through your main message in that book, what motivated you to write it, and then as we've gone through this very challenging period over the last six months, are there additional implications for your work that the coronavirus essentially is forcing us to confront. I'd love to start there. To some extent, I think the debate between what should the size of the government be and what should the size of the markets be is a very old one and occupied much of the 20th century. We talked about different kinds of systems and which one emphasized markets more and which one emphasized the government more. But both the government and the market leaves holes in it. And if you think about it, What fills those holes is what I call community, or broadly, the social side of our lives. And you can certainly see that in what's happening in different communities during the coronavirus pandemic. For example, this is a pandemic which hits the elderly more. And initially, before we got online delivery, what you had was a whole bunch of elderly people suddenly unable to go out, shut off from their normal shopping, and with the government obviously preoccupied with many other things, nothing left to fill the hole, except in community after community, you had people come together, the youth, and offer to do shopping for these elderly people. So that's a very simple example of how communities fill the holes. But if you think about it more deeply, think about schooling, the quality of your neighborhood school depends on the kinds of families there are in the neighborhood and how much time and attention they can give to the school over and above what the teachers are already doing. The kind of value systems that the kids in the community grow up with depend, again, on the nature of the community. In fact, there are studies now which show that community you grew up in the United States has a huge impact 
on your earnings down the line. And this is correcting for almost anything else. And in fact, parents who move their kid from community A to community B, well, community B, if it's a good one for career prospects in general, typically makes a huge difference in the lives of the kids who grew up there. So the book is really about thinking about this third pillar, how it has been weakened by so many forces, including the expansion of markets and the expansion of governments, but how it needs to be revived again to deal with some of the concerns we have today, the increasing automation, for example, of jobs, the need for higher skills in getting the fewer jobs they have, the deterioration in local institutions which allow you to get those skills, and the growing political divides in countries as people are in left-behind districts which are shut out of access to the opportunities that are being created. In other words, you mentioned coronavirus. Coronavirus has effectively exacerbated every pre-existing divide there was, and it heightens the need to think about how do we rectify all this and often the answer lies in building stronger communities. One of the things you say in your book is you talk about some of the inequality and the challenges that come from it. You say that the roots of inequality lie not only in technological change, but also in the failure of the community and the state to balance and modulate markets. I found that really interesting. Can you expand on where you're going there? One effect of technological change is to make it possible to transact more easily across markets. I mean, think simply of a reduction in transportation costs, which has allowed us to source many goods from across the world rather than producing it locally. And increasingly, companies set up across the world because they can control production elsewhere through information and communications technology. It's hard to imagine that a company would have a fully controlled subsidiary far away in the past, it would have to give it full autonomy. Today, that's not necessary because you can control what happens minute by minute there because of information and communications technology. So what technology has done is effectively integrated markets across the world, whether it's financial markets or actually real goods markets and increasingly service markets. The problem, however, as markets get integrated is that you find first volatility in markets becomes larger when it occurs. We no longer have local crises, but international crises. But also the governance of these markets tends to get elevated. I think just of the European Union, because the companies in that union want to operate throughout the entire European Union market, they want common rules. And so it's no longer sufficient for a community or a region or even a nation within the European Union to set the rules. It is set in Brussels at the union level. I mean, it's a little bit of a caricature, but in general, what I'm saying is integrated markets want integrated rules, which means power moves from the local to the national to the international. So that's one example where the growth of markets tends to disempower communities and make them less able to take the local action that is needed to deal with some of the local problems that emerge. And this is one aspect. The other aspect, of course, is governments having grown and become more national or international are very reluctant. Those bureaucrats in charge are very reluctant to give power back. And this constant leeching of power away from the local And that's another factor in the disempowerment. It's not just power, but funding and so on, which migrates elsewhere. And so to some extent, the book is a cry for decentralizing power, decentralizing funding. Once again, a kind of enhanced localism. And I am obviously aware that localism in the past has been a disguised sort of call by majoritarian leaders racist leaders in the United States, states' rights and block funding has often been a very, very narrow conservative demand because it eliminates or reduces the power of a liberal center. But I think if it is adequately couched with liberalism, inclusive localism can be the answer to many of our problems going forward. It gives people more a sense of empowerment, more of a sense of command over their destinies. And this may be what we need to deal with highly volatile markets and a very distant central government.
it seems that the force of technology growth and innovation is clearly a force for good and is a powerful mechanism for ultimately increasing people's standards of living. But as you say, the need for people to adapt comes rapidly and the technology outstrips the benefits, at least early, to a wide number of people. And so they're forced to adapt over a period that makes it very difficult. And it may be the case that COVID has just, as you said, just really accelerated this process. I'm wondering just if you step back and think about the potential policy remedies that come from a world in which technology is moving so fast and people ultimately benefit from it, but at least in the near term or even medium term, get left behind. You raised the issue of COVID. One of the places where a lot of people have jobs, not great jobs, but jobs that earn a living is in low-skilled work. And we're talking about anything ranging from working in restaurants, chefs, or waiters to doing delivery, working in the fulfillment warehouses that Amazon runs and so on. And the problem with COVID is because of the difficulty of getting manpower, some jobs have been automated. Meatpacking plants are looking to automate some of the work there because of the high risk of infection. And at the same time, some of the worker-intensive areas like restaurants may not open as much as they were used before because there's less demand for crowded restaurants now and perhaps for a few years than there was in the past. And so the worry is that this is one more example of technology as well as broader world forces causing people to have to adapt because after all, these low-skilled jobs are done often by the poorer, weaker segments of society, whether minorities or immigrants, and it's causing them to adapt more quickly. Now, what forms could the adaptation take? On the one hand, it could push people to seek out newer skills. That's difficult if you are 55 years old and haven't had a solid high school training and haven't been back to school for a long time. So retraining, reskilling, first, we have very poor devices for that. And it's also quite hard. It's something that has to be ingrained lifelong, as, for example, is done in Scandinavia. It can't be learned quickly. So this is one problem. If this is not done, the alternative is a stronger push towards redistribution. It can take different forms. I mean, people are talking about universal basic incomes. I think it's hard and very expensive, but there will be more talk about it. But there's also talk, for example, of higher minimum wages and so on, which will render some of the unskilled jobs a little more remunerative, but make it also harder to have those jobs out there because it'll make it more attractive for firms to automate them. The COVID crisis, of course, was a sudden stop in the economy and markets got hit pretty hard there in March and early April. Just a massive sell-off, just a gigantic spike in volatility. And of course, a significant amount of intervention by the Fed, both again, during that period and in some ways on an ongoing basis. As someone who is a gifted central banker in his own right, ran the central bank in India. How would you give the marks to the Powell Fed in terms of its intervention, how it guided markets along during that period? The specifics of the intervention will be debated for some time. In the short run, given what they knew and given what tools they had, I think the Fed comes out looking very good. They used a lot of tools. They used them very quickly. They essentially did what it takes, not just to stabilize U.S. markets, but they also reversed a significant outflow from emerging markets and developing countries. So in some ways, the Fed bought us time. Question is, having done that, at what point do you stop? And of course, what kinds of incentives have you created for the future? And both are extremely important. It has become a norm in international policy circles to say, don't worry about moral hazard in the midst of a crisis. And I think that's probably right, that you don't have to worry about people learning the wrong lesson in the middle of the crisis. Similarly, 
a lot of the discussion is about let's stabilize and then worry about what happens next. And that too is probably right. You don't want a full-fledged panic in financial markets. But over time, you have to ask, okay, I've stabilized, but is stabilization the right thing? Do I want all the restaurants and hotels and airlines and everything else to come back as they were before? Or do I need change? Which restaurants are unprofitable if they have to operate at half capacity? Which ones have to close? And how much sort of public money has to go in supporting them? So as soon as you ask the question of, about stability versus change, you have to ask, am I doing too much? Should I protect everybody? How about all these fallen angels who are now finding it easy to access markets and the markets being too lenient in supplying them with funds? And in the longer run, is this problematic for the economy because a lot of resources are going to cruise lines and airlines, which are better off restructuring rather than being as is. So that's one question. When do I stop or when do I taper off some of this intervention? And sometimes central banks have discovered once they get in, it's very hard to get out because they risk sending a very adverse signal and precipitating the panic that they were trying to avoid in the first place. But at some point, you've got to let the market make these decisions and not make it for the market. So that's one question. And the second question is the moral hazard one. If Everybody knows when there's a big enough shock, I come out to support the markets. Then do they have an incentive to take on liquidity risk, to take on credit risk, to take on all kinds of risk, which materialize in a big way when sufficient people are affected? So effectively, then any kind of systemic risk gets underpriced because they know I will come in at that time. Now, during the global financial crisis, we said, yeah, this is a problem. Don't worry about it now. We'll do something about it later. Well, we put in regulations on the big banks, but we really didn't do that much more. And the question is, has the Greenspan put become the Bernanke put, become the Yellen put, become the Powell put? And each time it gets even more reinforced and are the markets pricing things appropriately as a result? Well, you mentioned this sort of challenge that the more you do, the harder it is to sort of pick that right time to start to pull yourself away from that market support. And I was thinking about your time at the RBI, and I believe the very early days coincided with the Bernanke taper tantrum, which was this this utterance of this word that kind of sent the market into a little bit of a tizzy for three to six months. So I think the expectations part of it becomes so critical because people build trades around the certainty that central bankers are in a unique position to profess. I was going to ask, just broadly stepping back in terms of the world of central banking and thinking about maybe the early days of, let's say, a Paul Volcker regime, and he's credited with breaking the back of inflation and doing some aggressive measures and being courageous in a lot of ways. But in some ways, the markets were so much smaller. The world was much less financialized at that time than certainly at this time. And at every turn, the sort of market component of wealth seems to grow. What are the implications of that just for central banks? Are are the attentions to the market, are the central banks and maybe the Fed, are they overly attuned to the comings and goings of the VIX and things like the S&P 500? Or is this just a reality that they have to contend with, the sort of financial conditions aspect of things? I don't know what overly means because I think The uncertainty that central bankers have is how connected are things, and if I don't pay attention to it, could it lead to some kind of a chain effect or conflagration? So I think you're absolutely right that they are increasingly at risk of being a prisoner of markets. I mean, if you think about the Fed in 2018, late 2018, wanting to sort of liberate itself and go back to normal policy and being forced to make a 180 degree turn in December of 2018 because the markets were collapsing. The president was saying, you'll be responsible for the recession. And the Fed turns on a dime and basically says, we weren't being serious about normalizing or events have turned out such that you should discount what we said earlier. And That, to my mind, was when it became absolutely clear that the Fed 
could clearly not take its eye off the market. And I think that what happens is that as the markets become reliant on the Fed, the Fed becomes its prisoner. And Chairman Powell made a very strong effort in his early period to say there was no Powell put. But unfortunately, I think circumstances that developed towards the end of 2018 effectively forced the Fed to reverse and reinstated that put even if he had taken it off the table. I think this in the longer run is damaging. The question is, how do you get away from it? And that's really the conundrum that central bankers will have to face. How do they sort of get in so deep, but then get out without leaving a scar? That period at the end of 2018, as you've been describing, was so interesting because the market felt very much in charge. It was expressing itself via yield curves that were inverted. And I think it seems like the Powell Fed ultimately, maybe in combination with a flagging S&P 500, did a very strong about face there. One of the reasons that they got to do that was that there's just not enough reason to tighten in the face of inflation that's going nowhere. And there was another article, I think as The Economist this weekend was pointing to just this broken Phillips curve, that this idea that low unemployment would ultimately push inflation higher, at every turn, this Nehru concept became a new lower number. What does it mean for central bankers as they try to navigate a world where the causes and effects of inflation just seem increasingly, I think Janet Yellen called it a conundrum. How do you think about the world of inflation? It's a great question because they took on the inflation mandate in the late 80s, early 90s. Many of them switched to inflation targeting precisely because inflation was the problem then. And now they're a prisoner of the inflation mandate in the reverse direction. That is, if inflation is low, why are you so bothered? Why can't you let it be? And the problem, to some extent, which the central bankers will do their best to try and put at a distance, is the problem of financial stability. Now, they will say, and having been part of the fraternity, I know how the language goes, look, we have one tool, which is interest rates, and you're asking us to deal with two different objectives. One is sort of economic balance, and the other is financial stability. No, we can't do that. Let's just keep the interest rate to deal with ensuring that the economy is in balance and use macro prudential to deal with the financial sector. The unfortunate problem is macro prudential tools are relatively weak, don't particularly work well across the system. And as a result, what we have is with interest rates not being raised, given that there is no inflation in sight, with financial risk taking increasing and macro prudential tools often being ineffective, sometimes not being accessible, we sort of perhaps have more financial risk than warranted. And to some extent, the Fed coming in and flooding the market with funding is a recognition that certainly we weren't well placed for the financial risk that was being taken when COVID reared its head. So I don't think at this point things have gotten particularly messy, in part because the Fed intervened. But this goes back to our earlier question, which is, does this set the grounds for the misbehavior down the line by the markets, taking the Fed for granted, and then we have a repetition down the line. So during the March meltdown, of course, the Fed was very active, but so was the government, and the debt increase has been pretty significant in a very short period of time. I think the speed with which we're adding a trillion dollars of national debt has just shortened uh, at every turn. And yet we've got these market clearing prices of securities that seem unlinked, at least to the bond market vigilante world of maybe 25, 30 years ago. Do deficits matter? How should people think about deficits in a world where there's growing chatter about the value of things like MMT? What's your take on that? I don't know which aspect of MMT you, you want to focus on, but let's take the idea that central banks can easily finance governments and until the economy sort of shows signs of overheating, that's not a problem. And let's run that 
in an emerging market. And we know a number of emerging markets which get into trouble simply because they have high debt, not necessarily because the economy is doing fantastically well. So, I mean, take India, for example, which currently has debt to GDP in the regions of 65, probably going up to 85. It issues debt in its own currency, but it's already seeing some tightness in the financing markets. And certainly there's a very great reluctance. Now, the MMT people may say this is wrong. It should go out and spend. But there's a very great reluctance to spend much more, even though India has $500 billion plus in reserves, not so much because of worry about an external crisis, but of worry that it may reach the limits of its revenue-raising capabilities, which will result in both an expansion in government bond spreads, as well as eventually potentially inflation. Now, there are theories about how you can get inflation without reaching the productive capacity of your economy. That's the whole fiscal theory of the price level, which says that when you have fiscal dominance, when your deficits get large and the market suspect there's no way you can raise enough taxes to pay it back over time, then what happens is inflation starts rising in order to devalue your debt to a level that the market thinks is payable. So it is possible, at least theoretically, to get inflation even without reaching the capacity of your economy. For example, as you said, if we pile on trillions of dollars more of debt very quickly and you don't have much growth in the economy, you have a lot of unemployment, it is still possible to get an inflationary spiral, just as Zimbabwe, which did that a few years ago. So does the U.S. become Zimbabwe? No. There are many institutions in place, a lot of reputation, history, etc., which says it will take a long time before the U.S. becomes Zimbabwe. Is it impossible that it becomes Zimbabwe? No, because theoretically, there is no difference once you reach a certain level of debt compared to your taxation capabilities. So I think arguments that there is some kind of a free lunch out there are a little misplaced. And also, in some of the details of MMT, it's all about turning on a dime, that when you start seeing inflation pick up and you have a full employment economy, you start raising taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole experience of emerging markets is that doesn't happen overnight, and often it leads to further problems down the line. Now, industrial countries used to be different from emerging markets because they had better politics, stronger institutions. Now, seeing the last three or four years in the industrial countries, I think many people would argue those differences have reduced. So it may be that we embrace these new theories, don't worry, be happy, spend as much as you want, at the precise time that what made it possible is in fact no longer there. Put differently, developed countries can issue a lot of debt, especially at these low interest rates, without significant problems, but it's not that they can do it indefinitely without problems. And it's not true that the only constraint is full employment, as some versions of MMT suggest. It's almost as if we've going back a decade, the discussion around the Eurozone crisis was the, the only way out was austerity. And the work of Rogoff and Reinhardt was getting a lot of play. This time is different. And perhaps the experience of Greece trying to grow its way out in a belt tightening environment and the difficulties thereof has led to almost the opposite. What are the indications maybe that the U.S. is going too far in terms of deficit spending? Is it market prices or what are the things to be watchful for? One is obviously once you start seeing things like inflationary expectations starting to pick up significantly, or you see actual inflation start to pick up, that would be an indication that perhaps you have gone too far in debt sustainability. If you see long-term yields, the spread there widen considerably. But however, the question that you want to ask is not just, can we spend this much? Because the amounts of debt that we're taking on, as you pointed out, a trillion every few weeks, is not debt that's going to be paid off over the business cycle. It's not even debt that's going to be paid off by this generation. It is debt that we're leaving for our kids and perhaps their grandkids. Remember how much time it took us to bring down the 
debt that we had post-World War II down to reasonable levels. It took decades. And that's important to keep in mind because the spending we're doing is spending that is going to be repaid by future generations. So when people say, I had no responsibility for the crisis, make up my losses, the response has to be, who's going to make up your losses? It's not going to be other people in the same generation. It is going to be your grandkids. And what responsibility do they have for the losses you incurred in the pandemic? Put differently, what I'm saying is that at this point, we are eating into the spare buffer capacity of future generations. So we have to be careful about spending. I'm not saying move immediately to austerity. I'm saying that people who argue make everybody as well off as they were before the pandemic because the reason they're not well off is because the government is implementing these measures, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's very, very costly. And if you spend that kind of money, you're basically preventing the next generation when it has its version of the pandemic crisis from having spare capacity to deal with it. And so you reduce unemployment, you keep a lot more people on the payroll, they have less pain, but that pain has not vanished. It will show up down the line when future generations find it impossible to spend as much. So put differently, to conclude, it's not free money. Just because you can spend doesn't mean you should spend it. Calculated spending to preserve the economic capacity and to prevent really damaging distress in the poorest households. That has to be the watchword, not spend to make everybody as well off as they were before the crisis. I was hoping that we could address two final topics. So the first is on episodes of financial crisis, and then I would love to solicit your views on the state of relations and how you see the interaction between the US and China playing out. On financial crisis, in the period preceding the blow up in 2007 and 8, you wrote, again, another extremely forward-looking book called Fault Lines. And you really got to the heart of some of the vulnerabilities in the financial system. And as we were touching on earlier, we've got a very big financial system. There's a tremendous amount of counterparty risk, massive derivatives exposures that are taken around the world. It's quite advanced. There's a lot of capital moving around at all points in time and lots of exposures. And one of the things we've seen in modern finance is that this 10 standard deviation event seems to occur certainly far more frequently than any model would suggest it should. What's your take on that? Is that a just a feature? Uh, is it a bug? Is there something that we can do about it? Or is it just a cost of doing business in a very modern economy? I want to believe it's a bug, but it's not a bug which is easily dealt with. I do think these 10 standard deviation events don't come out of the blue. I mean, with the pandemic as the current exception, I mean, we could have been better prepared in terms of leverage, in terms of exposures to the pandemic. But yeah, the pandemic could be an out of the blue event. But more generally, I think that the real problem with financial crises is a problem of incentives. And while you cannot micromanage each element of the market, and no regulator has the capabilities, the knowledge, the experience to do that, I think it's reasonable for a regulator to examine the incentives of major players and ask whether they have appropriate incentives in place. And where there is a loading of risk, I think you want to look more carefully and ask why that's happening and how to deal with it. I mean, one example, clearly in this period of very low interest rates, is there is an enormous search for yield. And it comes from the more staid organizations within the financial sector your pension funds, your insurance companies, anyone who has obligations out there that have become extremely hard to service by investing in safe instruments, given how far yields have collapsed, has an incentive to go out and load up more on risk. So once you see that, then you ask the question, well, that's fine, but do they have the right background? Do they have the right risk management capabilities, et cetera, et cetera? And my guess, and you know this better, being more close to the markets than I am is that that's not always true. So now, once you recognize that, 
there's the additional question of, well, who's in charge there? Is anybody trying to look at the incentive structures there and trying to take action? And I think the answer post-financial crisis is the regulators certainly had the banks within their ambit, but their attempt to broaden that to other entities has been very mixed. And many have resisted sort of being drawn under the regulatory structure. And I think this is potentially a source of risk going forward. Not that regulators are perfect. (laughs) They're deeply flawed, but so unfortunately are market incentives sometimes. One of the, I guess, evolutions, I think, of philosophy almost in terms of monetary policy, at least in the U.S., has been to be increasingly transparent. And I always remember from my early days in markets under Greenspan, he has that one quote, if you've understood what I've said, I must have misspoken. He spoke in this obfuscation, trying to keep the market guessing. And there were these Thursday reports where we would get the money supply and try to figure out what the Fed had or hadn't done. And now there seems to be this desire to communicate at every turn. And I'm just wondering if there's a risk of over-communication because traders, investors, they lean on that sense of certainty sometimes. And that's where maybe these exposures build up. I'm curious if you have any view on that. It's a great question and even a comment in the sense that one of the virtues of being somewhat opaque is different people read different things into what you're saying. And therefore, there is some diversity in the market. One of the costs of these opportunities, but since everybody can see those opportunities, they tend to crowd on them. One way of seeing that is before the financial crisis, there was an incentive to load up on the asset that gave you the maximum return for the minimum regulatory capital buck. And that led a lot of entities to basically loading up on the same kind of assets. So this is I mean, a very crude way of saying, yes, there is sometimes virtue in opacity. Of course, it creates its own problems when that creates volatility, people not quite understanding what you said and taking positions. I think we're going to debate which side is better for some time. Well, your insights are so important for our listeners, and I thank you. I wanted to finish with the US and China. It seems like a lifetime ago, but 2019 was all about trade negotiation and this back and forth in terms of how these two behemoths competing for global leadership were going to interact. And then we had the schism with 5G and Huawei. What's your sense as to this relationship, what it means for global economy, for markets? How should investors think about the US and China at this point? I think that the fracture between China and the United States is not just a consequence of the current US administration. I think the current Chinese administration also has responsibility for how bad things have got. And to some extent, Maybe it was inevitable going beyond personalities to the old sort of notion of a rising power dealing with an existing power. But certainly the world that we were in was the world that the United States made post-World War II, a very successful effort at making the world order, but a world order which had little place for a quasi-communist economy, which was very successful, unlike the Soviet Union at producing things that people wanted to buy. And so the hopeful scenario is where we, over the next couple of decades, get away from specific personalities and they change in the US, they change in China, and we go towards what makes sense from the perspective of the two largest economies in the world, a world order where there's place for both. And while it's not a naive sort of embrace, there are places where they do a lot of business together, consumer goods, et cetera, et cetera, and places where they go their separate ways, whether it's military technology or artificial intelligence, and they clean up the disputes on that, the property rights and so on that currently are a source of friction. So that would be the ideal environment. And for that, you need some give on both sides, maybe a change in personalities at the top, but also deep remaking of the institutions that dominate the world, including places like the IMF, the WTO, and so on. The alternative, again, polar opposite, is 
they break up into two separate blocks, with the Chinese focused on becoming much more independent, which means they do their own R&D, they substitute for all the high-tech stuff that they buy from the West now, and they also become more independent in relying less on exports to the West. They have their own sort of sphere of influence countries that will buy their stuff. And so you get two different blocks in the world with very little or very modest interaction. And unfortunately, the way things are, that seems to be the way we're going. I think it is quite possible we come out for a little while somewhere in between, and then that would be better for the world. But this is a period when everything is up for grabs, and a lot depends on changes in personalities in both countries. Such a time of uncertainty in society, economies, and certainly market prices. And you've given us a ton to think about, Dr. Rajan. It was great to spend some time with you. I really appreciate you being a guest today, and our audience will certainly value your insights. Thanks so much for your time. You're most welcome, and thanks for having me. You've been listening to The Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time.